Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module on fluid dynamics. This video is about the applications of Bernoulli equation. Let's start with a recap. Uh, we derived the Bernoulli equation in two scenarios. The first was steady in viscid flow, uh, in which case we derived this expression on the left hand side, which I think we called b hat to be constant along a streamline and in the case of potential flow which uh, implies that the velocity can be written as the gradient of some scalar potential phi then you have a nearly identical expression uh, which has this extra term rho d phi dt on the left hand side and on the right hand side it's not constant along a streamline not necessarily only constant along a streamline but in fact it's a function of time and the same function of time for every point in space so in this video we are going to look at some applications and uh, the applications are divided into sort of two categories one for potential flow, in which case a mathematical expression for the velocity needs to be available so that it can be plugged into this expression and then the pressure can be found. But a far more interesting sort of application arises for the steady inviscid uh, kind where you don't know the full velocity profile you and even without knowing the complete velocity profile by just knowing certain features of the profile some useful information can be gleaned in this case yes it is true that the Bernoulli equation gives us the pressure but it's really a path towards gaining insight into something more useful than simply the pressure so let's warm up by looking at a simple example. The first example I want to consider is this flow through an opening in a tank. So imagine you have a tank full of water uh, filled up to some height h above an opening. The opening is small compared to the cross section of the ta tank and uh, when a valve is open the water starts to flow out through the opening on the other side is just air outside so it's really a hole in the tank and the question is how fast is the water flowing out of this opening uh, now what we are going to claim what I am going to claim is that we will apply the steady inviscid version of Bernoulli's equation to the water in here and uh, you are right in pointing out that this flow is going to be neither steady nor inviscid. Why? Because as the water flows out, the water level falls. If the water level falls, there is less of a um, driving force to drain the water out. Because after all, if the water level reaches the hole, there's going to be no more flow. So the flow is in fact going to weaken over time. Yet, I claim, let's consider the flow to be steady. Okay, I'll describe why it's okay later. And second, I'm going to say that the flow is inviscid. Again, the same sort of uh, question arises. Well, how do I know that the flow is inviscid? And to that, I will ask you to hold your questions until we have applied uh, Bernoulli, we have made the assumption, found the consequences of the assumption, and then we can go back and verify if our assumptions were valid in the first place. That's usually a very good strategy. All right, so here we go. Uh, in order to apply the steady inviscid version of Bernoulli, we would need a streamline. And in this case, I don't know the flow, I don't know the expression for the flow, so I don't know where the streamlines are, except I know some important things about the streamline, which is probably all I need to know. 
So here they are. Every fluid particle that flows out of the opening needs to be replaced by another fluid particle that flows into the opening from the tank. And that fluid particle needs to be replaced by another one to take its place and so on. And this chain of fluid particles is ultimately what is a streamline. The streamline is mathematically defined as the curve where the velocity is everywhere tangent. But practically it boils down to a chain of this instantaneous displacement of fluid particles one displacing the another, uh, the, the next, the one ahead of it. And a streamline cannot terminate within a fluid, which means every particle in the fluid, as it makes its way towards the opening, needs to be replaced by another one upstream of it. And this chain can only stop at the free surface, where, from where all the water is flowing. Right. So therefore, one can Imagine that there is a streamline that go, passes through the bottom of the opening, a point I label B, that is connected to a point on the surface B prime, or a streamline that is near the top of the opening, a point I label C, which again will be connected uh, via a streamline through a point on the free surface. Now the difference between point B and C is comparable to the size of the opening and it is implicit in the statement of the problem that the opening is small compared to the size of the tank. Okay. Especially uh, yeah, the height and the cross section area. Okay. So having said that, now I have a number of streamlines. I can pick any streamline from any point on uh, uh, in the opening. It will ultimately connect to a point on the interface. So as an example, as a representative, I will consider the streamline BB prime, okay? And apply Bernoulli's across the streamline or along the streamline. I, and I get PB for the pressure at B plus one half rho u b squared for the velocity magnitude at b minus rho g dot x b for the position at b that's the left hand side and it's equal to a constant along this streamline and that constant then must also agree with the same expression evaluated at the point b prime Now, what we know about points B prime and B are that uh, is that they are both exposed to air. They are exposed to the atmosphere, and that means there isn't that much pressure difference between the point B and B prime because the density of air is so much smaller compared to the density of water. That pressure does increase with depth, even in air, but that increase in depth would be almost negligible compared to the rise uh, of the pressure in water of equivalent depth. So we are just going to say that PB equals PB prime is atmospheric pressure. And as a consequence of that, if I label this one, these two cancel. Then I'm going to say that UB squared and UB prime squared, well there's got to be a relation between them, approximate as it may be, through mass conservation. Remember I mentioned to you that no matter what the situation is, mass conservation should always be at the back of your mind. And in this case, mass conservation says that the rate at which fluid is lost through the opening must be the same rate at which the water level is falling or must be related to the, the rate of fall of water level, right? So 
and the rate at which water level is falling gives you the speed at, at b prime and that is u b prime times a prime where a prime is the surface area of water that's the rate at which water level is or the volume in the tank is depleting and it is depleting because the fluid is flowing out through our opening at a volumetric flow rate u b times a and that means that u b prime is a over a prime times u b and therefore whatever rate it may be that the water is flowing out of our opening the water level falling is that rate that speed multiplied by this factor a over a prime where the numerator is the area of the opening the denominator is the area of the surface and because the opening is so much smaller than the tank we can take this to be small this is a small number and therefore this is much smaller than ub itself so on the left hand side we have ub squared on the right hand side we have ub prime squared but ub prime is so much smaller than ub that we can neglect it relative to ub squared and then what we are left with is ub one half rho ub squared is rho g dot xb minus xb prime and now if you take into account the fact that g points downwards with magnitude scalar g this becomes rho g h and the result is that u b let me write it aligned u b equals square root of 2 g h and this is the answer we get in response to our assumptions that we have made and a few of the assumptions that uh, I have already justified for example this one and that one and this is not uh, these assumptions are not critical as in you could have related the pressure at B to the pressure at B prime through hydrostatic balance in the air right so I could have substituted a more accurate version of this I could also have substituted this relation between u b prime and u b over there and eliminated u b prime in favor of u b and then solved for u b self consistently with the second uh, with mass conservation. It just turns out that I, I didn't need to do that in this case. These assumptions were dispensable. But the assumptions that we made that are indispensable uh, are the ones relating to the steadiness of the flow and the inviscid nature of the flow okay so let's go and verify so for the first one let's verify if the flow can be considered to be steady the flow can be considered to be steady if dh dt is much less than u u b because then at the instance that you are considering the water flowing out a large amount of water can flow out before the water level drops here we found that the velocity through the opening depends on the height of the water column above the opening and therefore if the height of the water column if h can be maintained constant then the flow can be maintained to be steady if h if somehow you keep on pouring water in the tank so that h is maintained constant then the steady nature of this flow can be maintained so the fact that the flow is unsteady comes from the fact that h is falling so therefore the rate at which h is falling quantifies 
the unsteadiness in the flow. And we can consider the flow to be approximately steady if this rate, dh dt, is much smaller than ub. And we have already established that dh dt is nothing but ub prime, which is a over a prime times ub, which is much less than ub from item number two. And therefore, the flow can be considered like this is the real reason we need uh, the opening to be small, to consider the flow to be steady. Okay. The second one is the flow in viscid. Well, you know a way of uh, comparing viscous forces to inertial forces and that's the Reynolds number. So let's estimate the Reynolds number for this case. We get the velocity to be square root of 2gh, but if you substitute something uh, comparable, like 10 centimeters of water column, then, uh, or even, yeah, even 5 centimeters of col water column, 0 0.05 implies ub, 2 times g is approximately 10, 0 0.05, meters so that's about one meter per second right. density of water is 10 to the 3 in SI units one meter per second the opening is maybe a centimeter to the minus 2 meters and the viscosity of water is 10 to the minus 3 Pascal and let me write it in, in terms of uh, SI units, kg per meter second. And all of this comes down to about 10 to the 4. So which means inertial forces are about 10 to the 4 times stronger than viscous forces. And because the Reynolds number is so large, viscosity may be ignored in this case and it seems reasonable the final thing to do is to really compare this result against experiments because it's okay to rationalize a posteriori but even that is making assumptions that the Reynolds number really captures the effect the relative strengths of inertial and viscous forces like we have convinced ourselves of that, but that's that not that's not that may not be how it actually works out in the flow. So the real test is uh, an experiment. So I'm not going to show you any experiments today, at least not right now. Okay. If I get inspired, I'll show you something. I may I may construct something to verify this experimentally. But this is the first application of uh, Bernoulli's principle, Bernoulli's equation. And I suggest that we take a break before we move on to the next example, which will be about the performance of wind turbines. Um, so I will see you on the other side of the break. Welcome back. Let's consider the next example, which is on the performance of a wind turbine. So here is a turbine um, shown in black and uh, the blades, the, the oncoming speed caused the blades of the turbine to spin in a circle uh, as shown by this blue disc. Now what this turbine is uh, designed to do is 
extract some of the kinetic energy of the wind that is incident on this circle all right if this kinetic energy is extracted then evidently the speed of air flowing through the turbine will be slowed down will reduce and that's just it is uh, a necessary condition for the kinetic energy of the air to be extracted by the turbine and a necessary condition therefore for the operation of the turbine is that it ex exerts a drag on the flow so as to slow down the fluid that is uh, passing through the uh, disc um, traversed by the blades of the turbine. If the turbine exerts too little drag then there is not enough energy deficit kinetic energy deficit in the wake of the turbine and by law of conservation of energy the turbine could not have extracted a lot of power from the flow on the other hand if the turbine exerts too much drag on the flow then uh, it essentially starts uh, acting like a fan and blows air backwards itself expending power rather than extracting power from the flow and somewhere in between these two extremes of very little drag and a large amount of drag we have the optimal operation of a turbine and this calculation that I'm going to walk you through is uh, an uh, analysis of uh, a simplified analysis of a turbine like this which illustrates the existence of this optimum and the value of the uh, optimal performance a quantification of the optimal performance of the of such a turbine right. let's start by defining the problem in dimensionless terms okay. so we have a turbine of area a which is subject to wind blowing on it at speed u where the surrounding fluid that's flowing air has density rho here we ignore the viscosity of the fluid because again you can calculate the Reynolds you can estimate the Reynolds number and will turn out that the Reynolds number for this type of a flow is too large um, of the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 maybe even 10 to the 9 and therefore you don't need to worry about um, viscous effects or so it would seem so let's just go with that assumption for now with these parameters the drag which is a kind of force exerted by the turbine op opposing the flow um, can be written in terms of the drag coefficient this is the drag coefficient as shown in this expression we have seen drag coefficients when we looked at non uh, dimensional analysis so this is the same expression uh, but with an area because this is in three dimensions uh, instead of length and uh, similarly one can use dimensional analysis to get the amount of power such a turbine can extract the dimensional prefactor is rho u cubed a and the factor of one half is again for historical reasons in fact this has some physical intuition also this is the kinetic energy flux passing through the area traversed by the uh, turbine blades which means this is the rate at which kinetic energy of air is incident on the area of the circle that the turbine blades traverse and the dimensionless uh, coefficient here is called the efficiency if uh, you follow renewable energy uh, development of uh, wind turbines you will know that they are characterized by an efficiency this is the same efficiency okay 
So, in a sense, what we expect in dimensionless term is that eta is a function of the drag coefficient. That is, if the drag exerted by the turbine, if the force exerted by turbine, the turbine opposing the flow is too small, then we expect the efficiency to be small as well. And if you exert too much force, then the turbine acts like a fan and then the efficiency becomes negative, that is your expanding power. Uh, and so we expect eta as a function of CD to have a maximum somewhere and we would, one would want to operate the turbine at that point. So in order to understand how uh, a little more detail of how the turbine acts with the surrounding flow, let us consider three stations uh, along the length of the stream tube that passes through the turbine. Right, the far upstream location on this stream tube we'll call station one. Station two is at the turbine and station three is far downstream. We start with uh, the free stream flow U, U1, which we'll call U1 at station one. Uh, and what we find is that as the turbine attempts to slow down the flow, uh, by mass conservation, U1 A1 equals U2 A2. And therefore, because U2 is smaller than U1, the flow has slowed down, the stream tube area has to expand. Here A1 and A2 are the areas of the stream tube. And similarly, if once you go beyond station 2, we have u2 a2 equals u3 a3 and the flow continues to slow down in the wake until you reach uh, far downstream for example at station 3 where the flow becomes independent of downstream location the area of this station a3 is again greater than a2 so the velocity of, air, of an air particle passing through the turbine is expected to follow this sort of a graph. It starts fast, but as it starts approaching the turbine, it gets slower and slower. As it passes through the turbine, it remains continuous and emerges on the other side and asymptotes to U3. So this would be the value U3, this would be the value U2, and this would be the value U1. Now, one can uh, imagine what uh, Bernoulli's equation does to uh, the fluid or what conclusion one may draw from Bernoulli's. Bernoulli says that P plus one half rho u squared plus rho g dot x, actually minus rho g dot x, is a constant along the streamline. Here we are all uh, operating at a single horizontal level so the effect of gravity can be neglected and what this equation says is that as the fluids, uh, if the fluid slows down that must be accompanied by an increase in pressure. In other words, if I have a fluid particle the reason it will slow down is because the pressure is higher on the upstream side and the pressure is lower on the downstream side. If that happens, then there is a greater force acting uh, from the upstream side which slows down the fluid. That's exactly the uh, interpretation of Bernoulli's in words. And therefore, one would expect the pressure to rise as you start approaching the turbine. And that's what is shown in red here between stations one and two. But something drastic happens at the turbine. What happens at the turbine is uh, because of the force exerted by the turbine on the fluid, there is a jump in pressure that accounts for that. In other words, the force acting on the turbine or the force exerted by the turbine on the fluid 
can be understood in terms of a jump in pressure. And one can and we will use this jump in pressure to write the force on the turbine. Okay. So this is the, the, the jump in pressure and we call it delta P. And then the pressure, the velocity continues to fall between stations 2 and 3. So the pressure continues to rise between stations 2 and 3. So you see the pressure is also monotonic almost everywhere except at the turbine where it has a jump. And because far upstream and far downstream are far away from the turbine, the pressure at those two locations is equal to atmospheric pressure. So this is atmospheric pressure. All right. So uh, Bernoulli equation will allow us to relate the pressure and velocity between stations 1, 2 and 3 to each other. And one can, on top of that, use our conservation law, our understanding of integral conservation laws to uh, derive a formulation that gives, essentially gives us this function, uh, efficiency as a function of drag coefficient. And once we have that, we can use that to optimize the efficiency. And that's the plan. So let's start with mass conservation between stations 1, 2 and 3. We have the rate at which volume crosses station 1 as U1 A1 must be the same as the rate at which vo uh, volume cro crosses station 2 and station 3. Okay, I will leave this as an exercise to you to use to connect the integral law to this uh, simple relation. Okay. The second one will be momentum conservation or momentum balance. Okay. We will apply momentum balance to the whole stream tube between stations 1 and 3. Okay. The amount of momentum entering the stream tube is uh, one half rho sorry not one half the the density of momentum is rho u1 and the rate at which fluid is entering it is u1 a1 so that's the rate at which momentum is entering our volume in this case our volume is this whole uh, stream tube between stations 1 and 3. No fluid enters from the sides of this volume because it is a stream tube. Along a, a stream tube is made of streamlines for the boundaries and the flow is everywhere tangential to the streamline. So we don't have to worry about any momentum entering from the sides. And the momentum leaving is in similar way rho u3 times u3 a3 more momentum would leave the volume if there is an external agency exerting a force on the fluid inside the volume and that force would be the force of drag minus d because the force acts in a Sorry, plus D. Uh, the force exerted by the uh, uh, by the turbine acts along uh, 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 acts opposite to the direction of the flow. And that's why. Okay. And finally, similarly, we would have energy conservation. And I know we did not derive uh, conservation of energy, but follow along with the same sort of logic. Let's see how much energy flows in. One half rho u1 squared is the density of kinetic energy, which means this is the kinetic energy per unit volume of the fluid times 
U1A1 is the rate at which fluid flows in through station 1 here and the amount of energy that flows out is the same expression but at station 3 U3A3 more, if more energy flows in that, than flows out implies that some energy was taken out and that must be equal to the power extracted by the turbine. Okay. So now here we have uh, U1A1 and U, U3A3 U1A1 and U3A3 and they are both equal. So we could call this quantity Q the amount of fluid flowing through the turbine and uh, use this to uh, derive D equals rho u1 minus u3 q and P is one half rho u1 squared minus u3 squared q these relations okay now we from our intuition we kind of know that u3 has to be smaller than u1 and that's why you would exert a positive drag on the flow and extract a positive amount of power from the flow i have already explained that to you in the motivation for this problem but we don't see depending on so what one can do now is u1 is fixed to u so we vary u3 and u3 becomes a proxy for the drag okay. but what we don't know is the relation between q and u3 because certainly as you start exerting more and more drag on the flow the stream tube is going to change in its cross section and the amount of fluid flowing through the tube would also vary so if we somehow knew how q depends on d independently of this relation then one might be able to eliminate the number of variables and simply get p as a function of d or p as a function of a parameter that d depends on and the parameter that we are going to choose is u3 okay or maybe u2 as we'll see uh, uh, something that quantifies the deficit of velocity in the wake and in order to facilitate that uh, we are going to use Bernoulli's now Bernoulli's between 1 and 2 and now we have to invoke the pressure Bernoulli's between 1 and 2 says the Bernoulli equation between 1 and 2 says P1 plus 1 half rho u1 squared is p2 plus one half rho u2 squared and between one and three gives sorry between two and three we cannot apply Bernoulli Bernoulli is between one and three p2 plus one half rho u2 squared is p3 plus one half rho u3 squared I take the difference between these two equations and uh, oh, I have to also account for the fact that the pressure could be different on the two sides of the turbine. So I say that the pressure upstream of the turbine is P2 minus, the pressure downstream of the turbine is P2 plus. So I have a streamline that starts at station 1 and goes all the way up to the turbine but stops slightly short of the turbine so that we have the pressure upstream and then the second streamline starts slightly downstream of the turbine and then traverses all the way to station 3 and I do that because I don't know the body force exerted by the turbine on the flow and therefore I cannot apply Bernoulli across the turbine okay. now I can take a difference between these two and find P2 
plus minus P2 minus actually the other way around P2 minus minus P2 plus so this minus that and you will see I can do that simply by subtracting the two equations from each other this factor gets cancelled and I have P1 plus one half rho u1 squared minus p3 plus one half rho u3 squared p1 and p3 are both atmospheric pressure far upstream and far downstream the pressure is atmospheric and therefore we have one half rho u1 squared minus u3 squared i can write it as u1 plus u3 u1 minus u3 and the drag is the pressure difference upstream minus downstream multiplied by the area of the turbine uh, I am going to refer you to the interpretation of the stress tensor and its expression in terms of pressure and in the case of an ideal fluid how the stress is given purely by pressure and I'll let you work out the details. You will need to take a, a volume that goes around the turbine like that on the upstream side you have P2 plus, on the downstream side you have P2 minus, the normals are of different directions and you'll find the, uh, the drag to be given by this expression. So that if I substitute P2 minus minus P2 plus from this expression there uh, in the next one, one half rho U1 plus U3, U1 minus U3 times A2. And this is an independent expression for drag. We derived another expression here. So what I'm going to now suggest that we equate the two. And I'll do that in black. Equals rho u1 minus u3 a2 u2 where for Q, I am going to substitute this one, the middle one now. And I do that because I notice that from this balance, I can cancel out a factor of U1, sorry. I can cancel out a factor of U1 minus U3 and, I'm, and I can also cancel out a factor of U2, can cancel out a factor of rho and I am left with u2 equals u1 plus u3 divided by 2. This is a remarkable relation. Uh, even if you, there are a lot of details that went into deriving this relation. And at this stage, I am completely uh, cognizant of the fact that starting from first principles there are a lot of steps that need to be put in in order to arrive here but if you are watching this and even if you feel a little lost it will help you to just realize the significance of of this milestone in our derivation what this says is that u2 is the arithmetic average of u1 and u3 which means the, if the turbine is ultimately going to slow down the fluid to a speed u3, half of that slowing down happens before the turbine and the other half happens after the turbine. Right? At the midpoint, you, at the turbine uh, station 2, the speed is halfway between u1 and u3. Like, that's remarkable. And we arrived at that without any explicit solution of the flow and this is all the information that we needed 
in order to now relate the efficiency to the drag coefficient or the power extracted to drag. And this is how you do it. So let me now summarize everything we have so far, right? We have the drag equals rho u1 minus u3 times q. We have the power, so one half rho u1 minus u3, u1 squared minus u3 squared times q. And we have uh, this relation u2 is u1 plus u3 divided by 2 now let's see how so in order to convert this into uh, into our dimensionless form uh, note that this was going to be one half rho u1 squared a times cd and if I now solve this for CD, I get the 2 from the 1 half on the other side. Rho gets cancelled and I have, uh, I substitute, this is, uh, A is the area of the turbine, so A2. So for Q, again I substitute A2, U2, so that uh, the factor of A2 gets cancelled. And I'm left with 1 minus u3 over u1, u2 over u1. And similarly, for the power coefficient, from the power coefficient we get, uh, sorry, let me just write it, equals 1 half rho u1 cubed a2 times eta. So eta equals the factor of one half rho gets cancelled from uh, here you get one minus u3 squared divided by u1 squared times u2 divided by u1. Okay. Right. And now you will see that this is both these expressions are dimensionless. And therefore, now we can define a dimensionless uh, sort of design variable. And uh, the, the choice is this, u2 equals a u1. and u3 equals b u1 a and b are the induction factors a is the turbine induction factor and b is called the wake induction factor which means uh, so induction factor is just a multiplication factor that gives the ratio of uh, the speed at that location relative to the free stream speed. So the turbine induction factor means you multiply by that factor in order to get the turbine, the speed at the turbine. You multiply the free stream speed by that factor and similarly the wake induction factor. And you see these relations for CD and eta are relation are written in terms of these induction factors. And now written in terms of these induction factors, you have CD is two, 1 minus b times a and eta is 1 minus b squared times a and uh, our relation between the different velocities is uh, b equals sorry a equals 1 plus b divided by 2 or b equals 2a minus 1. So what we can do now is substitute this a 
in this relation to get uh, the drag coefficient and eta as a function of a single parameter b and we can plot them against each other to see what we get. So I have a calculator on the side here when I substitute, when I eliminate b in favor of a in these two expressions so that they are both parameterized by a and when I plot uh, the drag coefficient versus a, um, the uh, turbine induction factor, then as the speed at the turbine becomes uh, smaller and smaller, the uh, that's starting from 1, it becomes smaller and smaller, the drag coefficient rises and the power extractor also rises. Uh, which is shown in this eta on the left hand side and the drag coefficient on the right hand side in green. Uh, and at some point the drag becomes sufficiently large that any increase in the drag causes a decrease in the power extractor and that's where a maximum uh, in the power extraction occurs. It so happens that you can you can maximize this expression as a function of a, and you'll find that uh, a max is uh, two thirds. It's exactly two thirds. At which point the maximum efficiency is 16 over 27, which numerically evaluates to approximately 59 percent, which means that 59 percent of the kinetic energy that is incident on the disk formed by the blades of the rotating blades of the turbine can be extracted by the turbine no more 59 percent of the kinetic energy flux incident on the disk of the turbine in the absence of the turbine as if, if the flow were not disturbed 59 percent of that undisturbed kinetic energy can be extracted by the turbine no more this uh, expression, uh, this result was derived, I think, in the 19, uh, in 1919 by uh, Al, uh, Albert Betz in Germany. And in parallel, this was also derived by uh, Zukowski in uh, Russia. And therefore, this is called, this result is called the Betz limit or the Betz Joukowsky limit. Both Betts and Joukowsky were aerodynamicists and uh, their ability to derive this expression and to derive this limit. And by the way, modern wind turbines, no wind turbine has been built that exceeds this limit because this calculation sort of puts a fundamental limit on the performance uh, of such turbines. No more than 59% of the power can be extracted. No more, no turbines have been built and modern wind turbines approach this limit. Uh, the efficiency of modern turbines is uh, between 50 and 55% compared to this 59%. So modern wind tur turbines come very close to this uh, fundamental limit of wind turbines. So, uh, with that, I would like to conclude this video. Before I conclude, let me make a few comments, if you guys get so far. This was my attempt to respond to one of the questions uh, or suggestions in the anonymous review that you left me, that maybe some of you would uh, follow easier if I wrote at the same time as I narrate, like in a traditional lecture. What that does is it makes the lecture longer. So today's video is about an hour long, but I don't think it should take you more than an hour to proce process it. Right? You can pretty much process it in real time. And uh, please let me know through 
uh, email or you know any other mode that you feel comfortable communicating with me whether you would like to see the shorter videos which are more compressed and edited and have the notes written down uh, pre-written down versus me writing the notes uh, live as I'm narrating. So that's the end of this video and I will see you in the next one or in the next live session. Bye bye.